So before I go on and classify the representations of SU3, I want to give you a representation that makes sense for any group G, any uh, Lie group. Um, and in the case of SU2 and SU3, I'll figure out what the weight diagram looks like. Uh, so it's called the adjoint representation. Um, so what is the vector space? Well, given a Lie group matrix group G um, with Lie algebra little g, um, the adjoint representation is the homomorphism add, capital add, uh, from g to gl of little g. In other words, the vector space on which we're acting is the Lie algebra of the group. And it's defined in the following way, um, add of a group element g is going to act on an element of the Lie algebra, say x, and produce for us another element of the Lie algebra, and that's going to be g x g inverse. So this is a bit of a funny way of writing it. I'm not writing it as a matrix. I'm writing it as a linear map. Add g sends x to g x g inverse. So you can check this is a representation, um, and it makes sense for any g. The most important thing to check is that actually this guy is in little g. So if I take x in little g, then g x g inverse is in little g for all g in the group. So I'll prove that for you. Um, so lemma, um, if x is in little g and g is in big G, then uh, g x g inverse is in little g. Uh, proof. What do we need to show? We need to show that for all t in R, um, exp of this guy times t, so t g x g inverse is in the group. So let's write out what this is as a power series. This is the identity plus t g x g inverse plus a half t squared g x g inverse squared. So that's g x g inverse g x g inverse plus dot dot dot. And now you can see what happens. This g inverse hits this g and they go away. And I'm left with um, identity plus t uh, g x g inverse plus a half t squared g x squared g inverse plus dot dot dot. And this cancellation happens in every single term all the way along. I'm always left with g x to the n g inverse. So in other words, what I get is g x t x g inverse. Just take the g's outside the x miraculously. And G is in big G, G inverse is in big G, X TX is in big G for all T because X is in the Lie algebra. So their product is in big G and that's what we wanted to show. Okay, so this makes sense as a representation. It takes an element of the Lie algebra and it gives us an element of the Lie algebra. Now, what is the induced map on Lie algebras? It's got a name, it's called little add. This is add star. So this goes, let's have a look again. This goes from the Lie algebra of G to the Lie algebra of GL of little g. In other words, it goes from little g to little GL of little g. So there's a lot of G's knocking around and they're all different. Um, they're all playing different roles. Uh, let's calculate what this is. Um, so how do I calculate add star of something, let's say x, in the Lie algebra? Uh, and let's let's also apply it to some y in the Lie algebra to see what we get. Well, by definition, this is d by dt at t equals zero of add x t x applied to y. That's how I define add star. Um, or well, it's how I calculate add star anyway. 
So what does that mean? It's d by dt at t equals zero of x tx times y times x of minus tx. So if I differentiate this using the product rule, I get x x t x y x minus t x and then it hits this this final term and I get minus x t x y x of a minus uh, sorry x times x of a minus t x and this is all supposed to be at t equals zero and when it's at t equal to zero, the exps just go away, and I'm left with x, y, minus y, x. That is, it's x bracket y. In other words, little add of x applied to y is just x bracket y. So I didn't actually need the group there to define this. This made sense already for the Lie algebra. Right? The Lie algebra little g has this bracket. I could have just defined little add of x applied to y to be x bracket y. So little add of x is the thing that takes bracket with x. So I could do that. And it turns out that gives me add star, big add star. So exercise add x y equals x bracket y um, defines a representation of Lie algebras. In other words, little add is a representation of Lie algebras. So that actually follows already from what we've done because big add is a representation uh, so therefore add star is a representation of Lie algebras but it's possible to check this directly um, right you want to check that add of x bracket y applied to z equals uh, add of x add of y uh, minus add y add x all applied to z so x y and z are elements of the Lie algebra and I claim that if you write this out you're going to get some nice formula that will be true for any Lie algebra um, by the axioms of being a Lie algebra okay so that's the adjoint representation for the Lie group and for the Lie algebra let's compute it for some examples let's do SU2 first um, so I'm going to do little su2. In fact, I'm going to do little sl2c, which is just the complexification of uh, little su2. So we had a basis h, x, and y for little sl2. Let's compute add h. Add h is a map that sends little sl2c back to itself. So what does it do? Or well, where does it send h? H goes to add h of h, that is h bracket h, which is 0, because it's an anti-symmetric bracket. Where does x go? x goes to add h of x, which is h bracket x, which is 2x, as we calculated earlier. Where does y go? y goes to h bracket y, which is minus 2y. So that's how add h acts on SL2C. And in fact, you know, how H acts on, on, um, on a representation is telling us the weights of this representation. So this tells us that the weight space decomposition of this adjoint representation is the same as it was for SIM2, the standard representation. There's a weight space with weight 2 spanned by X, a weight space with weight 0 spanned by H, and a weight space with weight minus 2 spanned by Y. So add is actually isomorphic to sim2 of the standard representation. So you can also compute add x and add y, but I'm not going to bother because we've identified which representation it is. Let's do SL3C, which is the complexification of SU3, little su3. So let's write down a basis for this Lie algebra, little sl3c. It's an eight-dimensional Lie algebra because they're not, uh, three by three matrices, so there's nine entries, and there's one condition, which is that the trace is zero. So 
that's eight degrees of freedom. So we need eight basis vectors. So here are six of them. Eij is going to be the matrix with zeros except uh, one in position um, ij. For example, E12 is going to be uh, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, etc. And there are six of these because there are six possible off diagonal positions for uh, the one to go in. We don't want a one on the diagonal because the trace wouldn't be zero. So we need two more and they're going to be diagonal matrices. So I'm going to pick H13 to be 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, minus 1, and H23 to be 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, minus 1. So I claim any trace free 3 by 3 matrix can be written as a linear combination of these eight. So one thing that I would like to do is to write H subscript uh, theta for the matrix uh, theta 1, theta 2, uh, theta 3. So theta is like a vector, theta 1, theta 2, theta 3. And remember, theta 1 plus theta 2 plus theta 3 is supposed to be 0. So you, you could think theta 3 is minus theta 1 minus theta 2. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute add of h theta acting on eij and also acting on these basis vectors here. Uh, let me do it on those basis vectors h uh, hij first well all these matrices with the thetas and the h's they're all diagonal matrices they all commute so h theta bracket hi theta is zero sorry h theta bracket hij is, is zero so these guys are going to live in the zero weight space um, because remember, what's what's happening here is h theta. If I take exp of i h theta, I'm getting this matrix e to the i theta one e to the i theta two e to the minus i theta one plus theta two that I was considering last time. So the eigenspaces of h theta are also going to be the weight spaces for this representation. Okay, so these are going to be zero weight vectors living over the origin in the weight diagram. And what about the eijs? Well, add h theta of eij turns out to be uh, theta i minus theta j times eij. Let's just do one example. Uh, let's do uh, e12. So theta 1, theta 2, theta 3 brackets with uh, E12, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, equals, if I multiply them together in the order I've written them, I get um, 0, theta 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and if I multiply them in the opposite direction, subtract, I end up with uh, minus 0, theta 2, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So overall, I get theta 1 minus theta 2 in position 1, 2. OK, so that's just one example of this. So I'm just going to draw this um, weight diagram that we had last time um, and try and figure out what the weights of this representation are. In other words, for these vectors e, i, j, I need to figure out you know how they're going to transform under this matrix x of i h theta and actually that's that amounts to figuring out what coefficients of theta 1 and theta 2 appear in this equation so for example this is telling us this the fact that e12 comes with the theta 1 minus theta 2 this is telling us that uh, for this weight space uh, k equals 1 and l equals minus 1 so k 
k was the weight of theta 1, l is the weight of theta 2. So in this picture, the k axis was pointing horizontally, the l axis was pointing uh, 120 degrees to it. Um, so 1 minus 1, I go 1 along to the right, and then 1 down slanted to the right, and I get to here. So this is my lattice, it looks, it's kind of slanted. It's like a hexagonal lattice. So this is the weight uh, space for uh, E12, it lives here. Okay, uh, what else do I have? Well, theta, uh, let's say E13, this is like, uh, this comes with a theta one minus theta three. Theta three, remember, is minus theta one minus theta two. So I'm gonna get theta one minus minus theta one, that's two theta one uh, plus theta two. So I gotta go two along the k-axis and then one in the, in the L direction. The L direction is up and to the left, so I end up here. Okay, um, let me just draw where the points are and then you can figure them out for yourselves. There's one here, um, there's one here, there's one here, and there's one here. So this was E13. Um, let me just draw a couple more integer points here. So this is, this is the lattice. And these red guys are the white spaces. Finally, let me just say, remember H12 and H23, sorry, what H13 and H23, those are both um, weight zero vectors. So in this diagram, I have to have a weight space with weight zero at the origin, and it's two dimensional weight space. So I have to somehow indicate, you know, how am I gonna indicate that's two-dimensional. I can't just put two dots there because, I don't know, look a bit a bit rubbish. So I'm going to put a circle around. That means it's a two-dimensional white space. If I put two circles around, it would be a three-dimensional white space, etc. Another way of doing this would just be to write the number two instead of putting a dot there. That's also fine. Okay, so this is a hexagon, an example of a hexagonal uh, weight diagram for SU3. So one final comment, the weight space decomposition of the adjoint representation is so important that it has its own name. This is called the root space decomposition. Each of these dots corresponds to a weight space that's called a root space and the weights that occur are called the roots. It's called a root diagram.